Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're finishing with what is supposed to be a college course on geology from an unaccredited Bible college. I think I figured out why they can't get accreditation. Let's go! Same processes that acted in the past? And then the same processes are acting at the same rates. Same processes, same rates. Same processes, yes. Same rates, not always. It depends on what process we're talking about. But really, with the application of the law of large numbers, even fairly large-scale catastrophes will happen with a somewhat regular occurrence to average out. And it bears mentioning that there isn't quite as fine a line between uniformitarianism and catastrophism as is being presented here. Since the 1980s, a new view, dubbed catastrophic uniformitarianism by Roy Lemon in his Principles of Stratigraphy textbook, are described as being like the life of a soldier. The life of a soldier consists of long periods of boredom and short periods of terror. So geologists are entirely aware that catastrophes can and do have geologic effects, but even when viewed from this perspective, there is no evidence of Noah's Flood, and there is still evidence against Noah's Flood. In fact, in this textbook that is explicitly anti-creationist, Lemon also comes across as critical of geologists who ignore catastrophes as geologic mechanisms, or those who deny the existence of mass extinctions, attributing the appearance of mass extinctions to statistical anomalies, or the fragmentary nature of the fossil record. So, on the one hand, we have creationists ignoring data and insisting on their narrow interpretation to the exclusion of several lines of evidence, and on the other hand, we have geologists who are willing to update their views based on new evidence and are critical of those who resist updating their views. Which is more likely to arrive at the correct conclusion? We're not going to deny uniformity. Uniformity is a principle of science. Without uniformity, in other words, laws that govern how the earth runs, laws that govern biology, laws that govern physics. Could we even study science if we didn't have uniformity? No, we couldn't. Which is part of how we know that Noah's flood never happened. It would have required several changes to the natural laws in order to actually work the way creationists claim that it worked. And so, uniformity of nature does not equal uniformitarianism, you're right on that, but it does lead to a generally uniformitarian view as a conclusion. No, but we're saying that uniformity was established by God, and we're saying that uniformity can be interrupted by God at any time. In other words, you are denying uniformity. If it can be interrupted on a whim, then it's not uniform by definition. So the problem with uniformitarianism is that it denies supernatural. It denies that catastrophic events have happened in the past. No, uniformitarianism does not deny that catastrophic events happen. It does have a tendency to minimize their impact on geologic processes, but that is not a denial of the events themselves. And it certainly denies that God interrupts processes. No, methodological naturalism does work under the assumption of uniformity and that the laws of nature don't vary. As such, it does not account for potential supernatural intervention. Uniformitarianism is a conclusion based on methodological naturalism, and using naturalism, we have found that catastrophic processes can have more of a geologic impact than previously thought, and so now we have catastrophic uniformitarianism. But creationists do love their us-versus-them picture of the world. Catastrophism? is a presupposition of a creationist paradigm. Uniformitarianism is the presupposition of evolutionary geology. Nope. Again, to quote Lemon, Contrary to popular belief, this debate had little to do with the conflict between science and religion. The theologians, of course, attempted to explain everything in terms of divine acts. It is true that their dogma could be made to fit in somewhat better with a catastrophist view of the world, although it must be admitted, even that must have taken some rather convoluted thinking. In other words, the catastrophism that was argued scientifically did not match up with creationism any more than uniformitarianism does. You just hear the word catastrophe and think global flood, and so assert that this is the position that supports your hypothesis even though it doesn't. So catastrophism is the belief that the geological features of the earth are more readily explained by catastrophic events, especially the Genesis flood as described in Genesis 7 through 9. 
No, that's the creationist twisting of what catastrophism was. In actuality, catastrophism was an attempt to explain the abruptness of the appearance and disappearance of animals in the fossil record. Largely popularized and championed by Georges Cuvier, the man often referred to as the father of paleontology, he believed that about 10,000 years ago, the then extant continents collapsed into the ocean, causing ocean floors to rise up and become the new continents. And then at a later time, a global tsunami led to a mass extinction. Cuvier favored the idea that that there were several successive catastrophes that caused the succession of organisms found in the fossil record. That's what catastrophism is, not the idea that one single catastrophe caused all of the geologic features that we see, but that several of them are responsible for the several distinct features that couldn't have been caused by one single catastrophe. And that is why catastrophism has fallen out of favor. The more we learn, the more obvious it has become that global catastrophic events are the exception rather than the norm, and usually they don't have a huge geologic geologic effect, with notable exceptions like the asteroid that left a global iridium layer that wiped out about 75% of species that existed at the time. And we, we are interpreting. Remember, geology is, this type of geology is historical science. So we're just as limited as evolutionists are. Incorrect. You're actually more limited because you start with the presupposition that Noah's flood had to have happened. So any evidence you examine is filtered through a lens of trying to fit in with that story, while the evolutionary geologists, as you've been calling them, simply look for natural explanations for the evidence. Sure, they do filter the evidence through the lens of magic isn't a good explanation, but so far we've never made any scientific advances by appealing to magic as an explanation for anything, so that seems to be a valid assumption at this point. But the idea for this class is for me to show you what I've said here, more readily explained. And depending on what you mean by more readily explained, I might actually agree with you. Saying God did it that way is certainly much easier than actually looking for a natural explanation for anything. Why is my hair brown? God did it that way. Sure, you could examine my genetics and determine that I have an allele combination that results in the phenotype of brown hair, but God did it that way takes a lot less effort. It more readily explains it, where determining the genetic cause is not as easy. You'd have to send my genetic material to a lab for testing using equipment that isn't always readily available. You might even have to spend some money paying for these tests to be done. But being easier to say doesn't make an explanation more correct. Catastrophism teaches that natural processes are insufficient to explain observable geological features of the earth. No, that's what creationism teaches. Catastrophism teaches that natural features known as catastrophes are what cause the geologic features of the earth. And it has been mostly debunked for about 150 years now, meaning that there is no extant group of secular geologists who hold to catastrophism to correct their errors when presenting it this way. Here are some things that we that uniformitarianism has troubles with has trouble with and we're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail. Transcontinental sediment layers. How did that much uniform sediment get laid down? Meaning it was laid down all at once. Why does it all have to be laid down at once? This is uniformitarianism we're talking about. Remember how you yourself explained it? The processes that we observe today occurring at somewhat constant rates for extended periods of time. We see sediment deposition happening slowly in various environments today. There are certainly some environments where it happens quickly, but something like marine life having their skeletons and calcified structures slowly broken down into sand takes time, and we observe it happening slowly today. So then suddenly to switch it all up and say it happened all at one time in one instant is not just straw manning uniformitarianism, you've actually done a poor enough job of explaining uniformitarianism that it is straw manning your straw man of uniformitarianism. Plate tectonics uplifted the Colorado Plateau. We're going to be talking about the Colorado Plateau. She doesn't go into detail, she just kind of rambles on about the Grand Canyon being really, really big, but let me elaborate for her. The creationist argument here is that the elevation above sea level of the land around the Grand Canyon at the end of the canyon is higher than the elevation of the land at the beginning of the canyon, with the creationist then pointing out the fact that water doesn't flow uphill as a gotcha. How could a river have carved the canyon if it had to flow uphill to do so? To which the answer is, actually, we don't entirely know. 
Certainly, rivers can carve through mountains as the mountains are uplifted slowly enough for the water to erode faster than the mountains are being lifted, and we have several examples of rivers that cut through mountain ranges through this exact mechanism, which is not something that can be explained by a global flood. But while continental uplift certainly played a role in how the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon, it is not the only factor, and by itself it's not sufficient to explain it. Which, given the creationist penchant for insisting that anyone who accepts evolution just looks for explanations that fit the evolutionary theory, you would think that the scientists would have twisted the data to make continental uplift appear to be the main force behind that, since we already have several examples where that is exactly the case. The fact that this remains an unknown is evidence against the creationist claims that scientists are tweaking the data to fit with evolution. Of course, here's the biggest problem. The Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon. Yep, it sure did. It had help from tributaries and side streams, but it definitely did most of the heavy lifting. The story begins. At least they're being a little honest there. The story, remember, once upon a time. Yeah, she's getting that from the Grand Canyon National Park Service website. It's not a scientific paper, it's a tourism website designed to keep the attention of lay people. So the use of flowery language is entirely expected. The very top layer of the Grand Canyon is limestone. Very interesting. Do you know anything about limestone and its origins and how it forms? Depends whether we're talking about organic, chemical, or detrital limestone. They're all a bit different, but what I'm thinking you're going for is the fact that some of the limestone is formed by the accumulation of remains of dead sea creatures, therefore the canyon was formed in Noah's Flood, even though when you look at the strata individually we see evidence of shallow seas having covered the area and then regressed slowly, several times, in both the Redwall Limestone group and the Toroweep formation, as well as the single progression of a large sea in the Tonto group, not to mention the semi-arid environments represented by the Hermit Shale and the desert environment represented by the Coconino Sandstone. Point is, if you just look at the layers and say, yup, they're layers laid down by water, then it can look like a flood, as long as you ignore the arid and semi-arid environments represented near the top, but if you actually look at the depositional environments within the layers, you can see that one single flood event is definitely out of the question. 70 to 30 million years ago, through the action of plate tectonics, the whole region was uplifted, <clears throat> and that's what we call the Colorado Plateau. Colorado Plateau is anywhere <clears throat> from 6,000 to 13,000 feet above sea level. Yes, the plateau uplifted between 70 to 30 million years ago. And this is where the problem begins, because the canyon was only carved by the Colorado River about 5 to 6 million years ago, so we're not sure how the uplift could have happened before the water carved the canyon, rather than at the same time. This is an unknown. But not knowing the specific mechanism of one specific instance of canyon formation does not prove that everything we do know is actually wrong. How are so many layers of sediment laid down in so large an area? You're kidding, right? That is one of the basics, one of Steno's laws of stratigraphy. It's the law of lateral continuity. In other words, deposition will continue for as far as that sedimentary basin will continue. Being a large area just means that it was a large sedimentary basin. And since those exist all over the place, that's not really a surprise. How did the seafloor rocks? There's the top layer of limestone. How did they obtain such high elevations? Through continental uplift, but if you actually meant how did the seafloor sediments end up at the top of the formation, that's easy. They were just the last ones deposited there. A more important question is how did the land animal footprints and the fossil raindrops end up in the sediments in the middle of the Grand Canyon layers? If the Tonto group represents the floodwaters covering the land, and the rest is just deep marine sediment deposition in the flood, then that means that the highest up we would expect to see footprints and raindrops would be in the Bright Angel Shale. But we also see them in the Hermit Shale and the Coconino Sandstone formations, which are high enough up in the flood model that they definitely would have been deposited as a deep marine environment, but low enough down that it couldn't have been the last deaths as the water receded. My answer is simple. We see depositional environments in the Kaibab Formation that indicate a marine environment because that is what the environment that formed the Kaibab Formation was. You still have to explain how we have arid environments between the beginning of the flood and the floodwaters receding. So how was the Colorado Plateau uplifted 9,000 feet without the deformity of the rocks? Excuse me? Have you seen the formation known as the wave? 
It's not specifically in the Grand Canyon, but it is part of the Colorado Plateau. Now, sure, maybe there are places that are remarkably not deformed on the plateau, and that's one of the mysteries, but I don't really feel like doing a deep dive on this particular claim, especially considering the fact that creationists usually use rock deformation as evidence for a young Earth, because everyone knows that rocks don't bend, so they had to bend while they were still forming during the flood. So either there is continental uplift that causes rocks to deform sometimes, or rock deformation is itself evidence of a young Earth. You can't have it both ways. If you look at other uh, uplifting areas, uplifted, other uplifted areas like the Rocky Mountains, those rocks have been drastically deformed. Okay, but like I said, A, there is deformation there, and B, even if there wasn't, or if I'm looking at the wrong specific strata, a unique feature in one spot on the planet does not prove that the entire globe was immersed in one flood, and that's what caused these unique non-global environments. Do you see the problem here? How does a river like the Colorado carve such a vast gorge, 277 miles long? By being longer than that? The Colorado River is 2,300 kilometers long, which is about 1,400 miles, meaning that the river is about five times as long as the canyon itself, assuming your numbers were accurate. This is supposed to be a problem how? in places 18 miles across and one mile deep. Oh, it's a problem because of how wide and deep it is. Yeah, it's called erosion. It's a hell of a thing. And the river had help from other tributaries and streams and whatnot. In fact, even today, the canyon is growing wider faster than it is growing deeper. That's some of the observational science that creationists love. So that's not really a problem. What's the source of the flooding necessary for downcutting? Downcutting doesn't need flooding. It just needs water going from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. I guess it took five billion million years for it to carve this out, but where was the volume of water? We've got to have vast, vast, vast amounts of water. I skipped it, but near the beginning, she does a half decent job of explaining the water cycle. Somehow, she managed to not figure out that that's where the water comes from. Five million years is a lot of cycles. Prediction versus accommodation. The flood would predict the Grand Canyon. Nope. If we make predictions based on Noah's flood, assuming you somehow worked out the temperature problem, we would expect the canyons carved by such a flood to be similar to the canyons carved by the flood that carved the Palouse River Canyon, just north of Palouse Falls in Washington. Pretty darn straight, as catastrophically flowing water tends to be, especially when it's so violent that it's carving through the material rather than lazily flowing with the lay of the land. Lazily flowing with the lay of the land looks more like how the Colorado River goes through the Grand Canyon, with all its meandering, bending, and doubling back. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Scott Worthington, who says, So, Eric thinks it's evil for a judge to not punish the guilty party. So when God forgives instead of punishing the guilty, then God is evil. That was on a video of mine responding to Eric Hovind, in which Eric had gone for an easy, we want guilty people to be punished, therefore there must be a God to enforce such punishment line. Unfortunately, it rather easily exposes just how heinous vicarious redemption really is. Apologists will often analogize God to being a judge, and when they want you to feel guilty for petty stuff you've done, they always bring up crimes like murder. But then when it comes to the vicarious redemption bit, they drop it down to misdemeanors that result in monetary fines and say that the judge is going to pay the fine on your behalf. Because everyone can see how unjust it would be for the judge to go to prison in place of a murderer, while the murderer gets to go free. So yeah, it's a damned if you do and damned if you don't kind of thing. Thanks for watching. Thank you to What Jesus who bought the Stream Deck off my Amazon wishlist and Brian who bought the Genesis Answers series for me. Special thanks as always to my patrons, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus again, and all the rest who are the teachers who educate the next generation at our finest unaccredited colleges. If you'd like students to graduate college without having a clue about anything, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!